Good afternoon. Great to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, that's right. I, um, I built a, a little business, a bit like Al's, uh, but around energy, the transition to clean energy and electric transportation. And I'm now spending a lot of my time starting to become familiar with uh, the space you're all in. And what I thought could be useful, it might be a little bit of change of gear, um, but I thought I could talk about what's actually happening in the broader energy and transportation space. Because one of the things that is happening in aviation is you're becoming part of the electrical system uh, with all of the innovation that you've already been speaking about and that you deal with uh, day to day. And so you, um, some of you may be already enormous experts in that, but if not, I'll take you on at a very uh, high speed through some of the things that are happening, um, which raises some issues that I think might be of interest to all of you. If not, you'll have had a few minutes on the electrical system and you can move on. Um, if you just read the, gener the sort of generic press, you get kind of two perspectives. On the one hand, you get this sort of, oh, the world is all changing and everything's going to go to wind and solar and, and, and it's, uh, it's a mini adventure, job done very quickly. We'll be on renewable electricity, Green New Deal in the US. Why don't we do it in 10 years? Not a problem. Um, but you also get this perspective. This is Vaclav Smil. He is the uh, preferred uh, economist. He writes a book every 10 minutes. The preferred economist of uh, Bill Gates. And he says, the great hope for a quick and sweeping transition to renewable energy is wishful thinking. So it's quite hard to know exactly what's going on. Rapid transition, nothing happening, and I spent 15 years trying to figure out the answer. So we started by tracking how much money was flowing. Simple premise, if you spend money on stuff, then it happens. If you don't spend money on stuff, then it doesn't. And there you can see that uh, over the period up to about 2010, money flowing into clean energy, so this is renewable energy, energy efficiency, batteries, smart grid, uh, and so on, got to about $350 billion, and then it stalled. So you can see the excitement, you can see the stall, gives credence to both stories. But what's happened is the installations of renewable energy have not stalled. They've continued to grow, you can see there, to about uh, 180 gigawatts per year. You can figure out a gigawatt is one big power station. This is not trivial. This is very substantial. Uh, and it has continued despite the fact that the money has slowed down. Why? The experience curve. Uh, it really doesn't matter that you're at a, in a different industry. and, a, and so All of these clean energy technologies and your own innovations in electric aviation, VTOLs and so on, you are riding the experience curve. The fact that things, when they scale, they become cheaper. And they become cheaper at a very, fairly predictable rate. And as long as they aren't constrained resources, like oil, then there's no reason to believe that those cost reductions will reverse. If you look at a solar farm, 2005, around when I started New Energy Finance, and on the right, that was a big one in 2005, on the right, you can see solar farms, obviously not in the UK or Finland or wherever, but in, in sunny places, they stretch to the horizons. That's why this stuff has become so cheap. Uh, wind, when I started, four megawatts was a big wind turbine, and then 2010, 2015, and now the wind farms that are being planned offshore, you can see they're 13 to 15 megawatts. My mum doesn't actually know what I do for a living, so I showed her this, uh, and she said, my goodness, those are really huge. They are monsters, aren't they? She's 88. And I said, yes, they are. That's well spotted, exactly. And she said, I don't understand, though. Why do you always build them in front of buildings? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got to the point now. This is a few years ago. Oh, when is renewable energy going to be grid competitive? Okay? And you can see there, onshore wind in the middle at about 8 US cents per kilowatt hours is approximately grid competitive. Of course, it's variable, but it's approximately the sort of price you need. Solar was at 17, offshore wind at 17, and where are we now? Solar and onshore wind, these are the world record prices, but you know, the median catches up with the world record pretty darn quickly, we've seen. And you can see there's sub two cents for PV and wind, and offshore wind, five US cents per kilowatt hour. So I'm trying, I'm trying to paint a picture of what's happening in electricity. We've not connected it to a plane yet, but just in the electricity sector, this stuff is getting really cheap. 
And it's getting so cheap when it's two cents or three cents or four cents per kilowatt hour that you find ways of dealing with the variability. It frees up, in a sense, a budget to deal with the variability, which also, by the way, has an experience curve, gets cheaper and cheaper to do all the things you need to keep the grid uh, up and running at night when it's not windy and so on. So this stuff is uh, very serious and it's growing, but it is only electricity. So what you can see there, that's renewable energy, and uh, in yellow you can see the wind and solar, the variable bit. And you can see it's growing. And what happens is as soon as you get 5 or 10% variable renewables in a system, it trashes power prices. It ruins the way the market forms prices. It becomes incredibly uh, disruptive. And that's where we are today. You can see that yellow piece is meaningful across the world, being driven now by the economics of the technology. The mainstream sort of energy economists are completely wrong-footed by this. This was the IEA. I've got many good friends there, but this is what they forecast in 2002 for solar cumulative on the left, annual installations on the right, and this is what happened to their forecasts since. <laughs> any, any Americans here in the audience? Okay, because the EIA, the IEA is based in Paris. That's the global body. The EIA which is part of the, energy, uh, the Department of Energy, um, is actually even worse. That's the same chart. Look, the black line. The actual is the same. That's the IEA's forecasts. That's the EIA forecasts. This is not a good use of your taxpayer money, <laughs> producing forecasts that are this bad. You have Bjorn Lomborg saying solar and wind are 0.8% of global energy. And in a quarter of a century, referring, of course, to IEA, EIA forecasts, it will be 4%. And he's making a fool of himself. He's making a fool of himself because wind and solar don't produce generic energy. They produce electricity, primary energy, nuclear versus hydro. I was a nuclear engineer for a while. So nuclear, the primary energy that Lomborg talks about, the problem with that is that most of that is thermal waste, goes up the chimney. What actually gets produced is electricity, so if he was talking about electricity, not primary energy, his conclusions would be different. I've tried to tell him. He doesn't listen. So there we go. 1% of primary energy is actually, in 2017 already, 6% of electricity, 22% by 2040, even if you're conservative, even if you can continue producing these charts that make no sense. And actually, the team that I created and trained has a figure more like 40%. So the electrical system you're going to be plugging all your planes into is going to be dominated by very cheap power but coming at odd times of the day and year. That's just a fact of life that you should internalize because it could be important. It looks weird when I say this is California. This is actually California at 50% renewables. Over on the right, the left is the past, the right is the future. That's just 50%. California has decided to be 100% clean energy by 2045. Where I'm going is batteries. This is Europe. Unlike California, we have this thing called winter. So there's a past on the left and winter. And you can see that the structure of electricity gets really, really complicated. And the problem with electricity, it's a bit like Airline tickets. If you don't use it, you lose it. You have to keep it balanced. Supply and demand has to balance at any time, real time. Long term over on the left, medium term, short term. Now, luckily, I said that variability is not that much of a problem. There's five technologies there that are already being rolled out at scale with double-digit growth rates that help to manage the intermittency or the variability of wind and solar. You can see interconnection, pumped storage, demand response, electric vehicles, and batteries. There are other weird and wacky technologies that might or might not scale, flywheels, compressed air, all sorts of things. And then if you look at seasonal storage, you pretty much have to talk about molecules. Again, I'm, just, I'm not the expert in your sector, but maybe you can see some touch points when you start talking about hydrogen, you start talking maybe about ammonia, which would be more relevant if this was a shipping audience. 
But this is the direction we're going to have to go to deal with seasonal variations. And everything has to be digital. You cannot manage this system without all of your infrastructure being digital. Luckily, we're going into a future where that's not that hard. Chips and sensors, communications, processing, whether it's in a device or in the cloud, it's going to be ubiquitous. Of course, machine learning and transactions that will pervade the system. So that's what's coming in the energy system into which you're connecting. Now, we can talk about the transport system, which is converging and is, of course, ahead of aviation. Um, prices, this is the Washington Post, prices on electric cars will continue to drop until they're within the reach of the average family. How many times have we read that? This was originally written in the Washington Post about this car in 1915. But it's starting to happen. Growth rates there, Asia on the left, Europe in the middle, America's on the right. Compound annual growth rates of 50, 60, nearly 90%. This is Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the team I recruited and trained. Their forecast, I think they're probably being pessimistic about the out years of this, uh, but their forecast is that more than half of all new vehicles bought in 2040 will be electric, and more than a third of every vehicle that you see on the streets. Why? Again, the biggest reason is the experience curve. We've seen solar and wind, batteries, Another 20% learning rate. What it shows is that by 2018, for most families, an electric vehicle is the same price as running internal combustion engine. By 2025, 2026, the showroom price of an equivalent vehicle will be cheaper. And by the way, they accelerate better, they're more fun to drive, better platform for connectivity, driverless, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Air quality, it's not just Shanghai, Los Angeles, Paris. I was on the board of Transport for London, not proud of that at all. And then, of course, the industry has been enormously disrupted. There are still some people who say, oh, it's all, you know, Tesla is a flash in the pan and they're not serious. This is, if you look at the segments in which they compete, luxury saloons, luxury, the bling SUVs, not the cheap ones, the small, mid-sized luxury cars, that's Tesla. And, of course, we know what's coming next. The Tesla Semi and the pickup. Models being launched, over 300 models by 2025 around the world, not just in Europe, not just in China, not just in India. Uh, this is unstoppable. There's Dyson. So we're hoping that that will be the first electric car that will actually clean up after itself. <laughs> and, of course, it's not just cars. Right now, there are 400,000 electric buses at TfL. We were very proud. We had about 120 of them. Shenzhen has 16,400 electric buses, purely electric. They're not doing it for fun. They're not doing it for greenwashing, and they're not doing it to try to attract you lot as tourists. It's cheaper, and they have an air quality problem. Commercial vehicles, actually there's some fun ones there. I went out, on the, you see that little robot chap there? Starship Technologies, and then there's another one, the FedEx one. Um, extraordinary consumer acceptance, forget drones for a parcel delivery. These things would be trundling around on the streets way before you got drone-based parcel delivery in most of the cities of the world. Two-wheelers, interesting fact, two-wheelers have already destroyed about 600,000 gallons, uh, sorry, barrels per day of oil demand. If you take two wheelers and buses together, it's destroyed a million barrels a day. Think of all of the acres of newsprint you've read about the OPEC cuts. And how many articles have you read that say, actually, this has taken out as much demand as OPEC has taken out supply with all of those negotiations so heavily reported on by energy journalists whom you shouldn't bother reading. Ships, a lot of people say, oh, ships, they go far too far. You can't possibly have an electric ship. Most ships don't go 7,000 miles. 
you have a lot of ferries, you have a lot of coastal freighters, uh, and all of the short distance ships will go electric too. And then all sorts of utility vehicles, pick up uh, garbage collection, uh, diggers, anything that goes underground in a mine, obviously, forklift trucks, and so on. A couple of myths to bust. Public charging infrastructure is being built. It's not that difficult. It's not that expensive. It's a bit like when we first went on the internet. You used to get a busy signal. There weren't enough modems. It was a big deal. And then a few years later, it wasn't a big deal. Cobalt and lithium. The prices started shooting up, and Twitter was full of all these people predicting that there wasn't enough lithium, there wasn't enough cobalt. Well, guess what? There is, uh, that is solar-grade silicon back in the days when, when solar took off. And the prices went from $20 per kilo to nearly $500, and then they came back down again. Why? Because the best solution for high prices of a commodity that isn't inherently scarce is high prices and investment. Isn't it all going to go to fuel cells, though? There you see battery electric vehicles growing, as we've seen, drawn to scale, drawn to the same scale, fuel cell vehicles. And if I came back here, if I'm invited back, Al, in 10 years' time, I'll show you the same chart. The scale will have changed by an order of magnitude or two, but the chart will look the same. Why? Because fuel cells are a really stupid solution for <laughs> short distance transportation of any sort. Maybe aviation might be different because of weight issues, but other than that, really stupid. There's the Tesla Model 3 and the Toyota Mirai, which you can buy. The Toyota Mirai is much cheaper to fill with hydrogen, uh, sorry, much quicker, 10 minutes. But you'll see that it costs more it actually weighs more. In fact, most people, when they charge their electric vehicles, simply plug it in at home most of the time. Maybe a couple of, year, a couple of times a year, you drive a longer distance, but do you want to go to a hydrogen filling station every week, once or twice? Because every so often, you go and visit Aunt Aggie in Leeds. You'll use a different vehicle or public transportation for that one trip, and meanwhile, actually, you're fueling and it takes one minute. Drivetrain, moving parts, 17 versus 200, cheaper, quicker to maintain. And then this last one, efficiency. The biggest problem with hydrogen in short, medium distance transportation is this. Let's take a car that needs 18 kilowatt hours to drive 100 kilometers. It's a kind of a Nissan Leaf type car, a Tesla 3, a BMW i3, that sort of vehicle. To generate the power, what I call wind to wheel, so at the wind turbine, at the solar, at the nuclear power station, whatever you're using for electricity, you would need to generate 28 kilowatt hours because there are losses, losses in transmission, AC to DC conversion, batteries and so on. The problem for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles is you've also got two chemical conversions, electricity to hydrogen, hydrogen to electricity. And there are limits to how efficient those conversions can be. And that means that you need approximately twice the input electricity to go the same distance. So if you've got electricity, you want to drive somewhere, you stick it in a vehicle, in a battery, and you drive somewhere. Turning it into hydrogen is a really stupid thing to do. Now, hydrogen has good uses in the economy. Steel making, seasonal storage, and so on, and potentially in aviation. But don't expect to piggyback on urban transportation or anything like it, any short, medium distance transportation for your supplies of hydrogen like I see in that picture over there. So let's just very quickly, Paris, we all know, we should know that there's a real constraint on CO2. Second half of the century, we've got to be at zero emissions. Um, all this is great, decarbonizing what you've seen. Historical trend will be decarbonized in 150 years. If you believe me and the, my former colleagues that I sold, 
Then we'll get there at about 2075. The problem is electricity is only about 20% of energy demand. It's penetrating energy demand slowly. You know, every so often one of you goes out and buys an electric hob. It's not fast enough. It will take 400 years for electricity to penetrate the global energy system as a whole. There are scenarios where it goes faster. That's something that I do a lot of work on, looking at whether you get to a break point where solar ammonia becomes cheaper than uh, making fertilizer out of natural gas and so on. So that's the energy system. I'm barely going to talk about aviation because you're also much smarter. You've already learned everything there is to learn this morning. But obviously, we've got trends both at the very small aircraft, the urban taxis, whether they're going to happen in that form or not, the VTOLs, and also then hybridizing larger, uh, l larger craft. And you don't probably need me to tell you I think this is going to happen. There are lots of good reasons why it will happen. It will start small. It will get larger. I was just looking. Uh, apparently, there are 130 models of VTOLs. Amazing. But like I say, you know much more about these than I do. But I thought I'd share this with you. Power supply at airports. A big international airport, Heathrow, Munich, LAX, those sorts of airports, probably have about 50 megawatts of power supply. What's it doing? The lights, the air traffic control system, the terminal buildings, security, etc., etc. Regional airport, maybe 15 megawatts. Local airport, could be 5 megawatts, could be less. Might have very little uh, power requirement. An apartment block, you can barely see. I'm talking about 0.1 megawatts, 100 kilowatts. Uh, 100, uh, yeah, 100 kilowatts. Large office block. We're talking, you know, big office block in the city of London or in Manhattan, maybe 5 megawatts. One small VTOL, yes, that might be like a, a high-end Tesla or a Porsche. That might be a few hundred kilowatts. If you start to talk about electric light aircraft, something that can go a few hundred miles, and you say, well, I need to get this back off the ground in 15 minutes, or I want to refuel it in 15 minutes, then you're starting to talk about half a megawatt. You start to, if you want to look at how many of those vehicles you could charge simultaneously from the existing power supply at a huge airport like Heathrow, you're talking 25. Okay? So if you haven't thought about how you're going to charge all these vehicles, you better start thinking about it now because you're going to plug it into something that's not going to be able to deliver the juice fast enough. If you want to have some real fun, there's your 25 drawn on a different scale. There's your 25 electric light aircraft, which is going to blow up Heathrow's uh, um, uh, power system if it's not massively invested in. And then if you say, well, let's look at those big guys. Let's go crazy and say, how, how fast, when you actually put jet fuel into a 737, what's the equivalent charging rate? And the answer is, it's something like 300 megawatts. One Boeing 747 is something like a gigawatt. Now, it's not quite, that's not fair because the efficiency of electric is higher, and therefore you could probably divide those figures by two. I've just realized as I speak. But it doesn't matter. The point is, the electrical system, which is developing very rapidly into this digital, clean energy system, can't cope with all the things that you lot spend all your time talking about. Thank you. Just a quick question, but Tesla, yeah. Tesla built the biggest uh, lithium battery in southern Australia in 100 days. Yeah. And that's over, so I think it's 130 um, uh, megawatt hours, uh, yeah. 100 megawatt uh, capacity. So there's no reason why airports can't do the same. Uh, listen, they sell the electricity yeah. just like they sell fuel. Uh, sorry, let me just clarify. I'm on your side, <laughs> right? But. But look at how much that battery costs to build. Well, it's very profitable now. Right? It's very profitable now. Fine. So you're going to, so then, the, the, wonderful. 
as long as you have got the costs of paying for all of that in your business models, you'll be fine. Because technologically, yes. I've told you, there's enough lithium, there's enough money in the world, and so on. But this stuff is not just sitting around waiting for you to plug in. That's the point. Of course, yeah, my point yeah. is it took 100 days to build it. Yeah, but uh, careful, because um, let's put it this way. They didn't have to develop new uh, mines and a new supply chain for batteries. I mean, just to put that in perspective, do you know how long that battery runs the Australian grid for? If you, are, if you were using it rather... Because all that battery does, by the way, is voltage management. It doesn't... It balances the voltage, right? It runs, the, it runs even that state's grid for something like 14 minutes, all right? And it would power, if it's 100 kilowatt, uh, it's 100 megawatt hours, that would be enough, what would it be, to charge? It would, it would, charge, it would give you 1,000 charges, but that's it. And, I, and, and so I think, yes, you're going to have to build that sort of battery, but that's probably at every major airport, and that battery was about 100 million, I believe. So, you you know, and, and okay, the prices will come down, but these are the sorts of things, this is, sorry, I'm sort of done because that's exactly the discussion that we have to have. That's exactly right. How, who's going to pay for it? How does it get financed? And so on. Because it has to happen. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay.